Hi everyone, welcome back to grassfedgirl.com. This is Caitlin and I am here today. It's so exciting. We're with Sally K. Norton. She is an oxalate expert and she has many insights in the ketogenic and carnivore diet. So she's going to be telling us all about what her story is and all of her research into oxalates. So stay tuned. This is going to be amazing. So welcome, Sally. I'm so glad you're here with us. Thank you. It's nice to meet you and your listeners. It's fun. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I heard your interview a few first time a few months ago or maybe a year ago. I don't know. And different ones. Um, and, you know, I just resonated with it a lot because uh, when I was a, a young child, even I had um, a lot of problems with urinary tract infections and I took tons of antibiotics, of course. And I'm sure that... <laughs> didn't help uh, set the stage for my autoimmune breakdown later in life that happened when I was around 30 uh, after being a vegetarian and um, many other missteps. So um, that's, you know, one thing that really motivates me is helping other people to avoid all the mistakes that I did. And so maybe Sally can shed some light on this oxalate issue that maybe many of us are not aware of. And, uh, so tell us a little bit about your story, Sally, and what got you into this field of study? Well, it, it wasn't from UTIs, thank goodness for that. But I was told I had Hashimoto's and I've had all these just, you know, bizarre problems over the years with my health. I was told I was pre-lupus and I was RA-like and just, you know, all kinds of autoimmune type things, a lot of arthritis and skeletal muscle problems and just it goes on and on it's a really long list of and I was always into eating well you know ever since I was in kindergarten I was interested in doing right by my body and eating the right things and growing strong and not getting sick was really like the thing I was interested in and and maybe that was because I did have some um, troubles with ear infections as a little girl and I wasn't allowed in the swimming pool because I would get swimmer's ear like that and that was a bummer. <laughs> I'm a Pisces. I like the pool. <laughs> and, you know, so maybe, you know, really early in life, I was already reaching for how to live healthy. So by the time I was in senior in high school, I was learning about vegetarianism and all of that. And I decided in seventh grade that I could study nutrition as a college program and help people avoid illness. Like I was interested in doing health promotion with nutrition as like the foundation for health. So I've been in that mindset forever. And it didn't work out too well for me. <laughs> I ended up with so many problems. Eventually I had to quit my work. I just couldn't really even work anymore and had to have a total hysterectomy right after I quit my job because I was bleeding to death with fibroids and I couldn't exercise anymore. I could barely read anymore. I was pretty much spent three years disabled of not really able to work or do anything. So I started doing some volunteering in my community so I'd have a life. <laughs> and researching what was wrong with me, I found out I had a sleep disorder. My brain was waking up 29 times an hour. And the research I did on that said, well, that's auto intoxication, probably coming from gut dysbiosis or something that causes that kind of brain problem for sleeping. And so I was trying to fix SIBO that I didn't have. I even took the SIBO medications because I had all the signs of SIBO and I believed in it. So, you know, I convinced my doctor we should treat it anyway, even though I failed the methane breath test and all that. It wasn't really SIBO, but it sure seemed like it. And what else could it be? That was the great explanation of the time back in 2013. SIBO was everywhere. So, you know, it took more and more research and experimentation and, you know, I eventually pieced it together that oxalate was the toxin that was waking up my brain, making it impossible to sleep and read and function and really totally disabled me. And that was a total revelation to me because nowhere in my education as I taught that oxalate was a neurotoxin that could ruin your sleep, let alone a toxin that could give you UTIs or an autoimmune condition or arthritis or any of that stuff. I never learned that in school. All I knew is that if you ate too much oxalate, you reduce the amount of calcium that you'd absorb from your food. 
So you need to be aware of that. And there's definitely an oxalate connection with kidney stones and people with kidney stone history or urinary problems should learn about where the oxalates are in their diet and start uh, steering away from those foods so they can keep their kidneys healthy. So I knew all that. And I knew that most people with kidney problems didn't want to believe that either. And, you know, I've told friends and relatives and neighbors, oh, you got a kidney stone, you shouldn't eat oxalates. But it never occurred to me that I was a person who needed to worry about oxalates. So I've been on this adventure of healing myself, getting back to the literature, and it's been an amazing progress, process of discovery. And at the beginning, when I finally recognized what had been trashing my sleep, my joints, giving me uh, Hashimoto's or whatever, when I realized what's going on with me, I realized that no one's getting help. And you can't go to your doctor. You can't go to any even holistic therapist or naturopath. They don't know about this, so they're not going to see it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been going to naturopathic doctors and different practitioners for years and I never heard about oxalates and the first time I ever heard about oxalates was in I used to be really into the GAPS diet and that was like the first time I ever really heard about oxalates I mean when I first went paleo people were talking about phytates and lectins but not so much oxalates um so it's a whole new world really um and I think most practitioners I mean I went to nutrition school in Bauman College in Berkeley and for two years and I never heard about oxalates. So um, for sure, I agree. It's interesting that it is so new to us because it's an old problem that goes back to the 1800s and it's been in the medical literature as a discussion point since 1850. In fact, even earlier than that, the first big toxicology study was published in 1823. Wow. Uh, and this used to be a diagnosis and they dropped it around 1930 because it's very hard to measure. It's really hard to diagnose this thing. And you can't just take blood or urine and say, oh, you do or don't have too much oxalate going on in your body. It, there's, it's not easy to test for it. So we dropped it because you know it must not really exist. If we don't know how to test for it, then it's not real. It's kind of our mentality, I think. <laughs> well, it's, it's just sounds like Hashimoto is like, we don't have a treatment, so just. Right. <laughs> just go so away. That's the, there's so many reasons to ignore it, you know, like, okay, so the treatment is teaching people how to eat differently. That makes no money. That doesn't, that's not what medical people do. That's so too much work. Not their job. It is a lot of work. It's a lot so, of work. So were you working in nutrition when you were first um, sick? Well, I've been in the field of so basically public health my whole career. I was working in the inner city in Cleveland teaching a health promotion uh, with the adults. I did all the nutrition programming and with the kids, we had an anti-gang program uh, that was giving them an alternative um, thing to be involved with so that they would have a richer life and wouldn't be uh, tempted by gang activity in the big city. So I was at the time a vegetarian and I would, I would did a whole weekend retreat for a senior lunch program, teaching the whole staff about vegetarianism and, why and how to serve more vegetarian foods on the menu for the senior lunch program. So, I, you know, I've done all the bad things <laughs> in my career. You send them, I'm um, sorry, your sorry cards. <laughs> yeah, my, I'm sorry. I feel like I have a debt to pay there. So I, how I've just carried on these messages that convinced me to go vegetarian when I was around 19, I guess. And I was vegetarian for about eight years. And then I was vegan for an additional eight years. Oh that my goodness. Horrible. And I couldn't put it together. I wasn't smart enough to put it together. And I suppose eating that way slows your brain down enough that you can't. And we're so convinced. I mean, it's, we've been convinced as a society for about 400 years that it's more noble to eat the flesh of stationary beings with leaves than it is to eat animal flesh. And um, we are so convinced of that, that we're blinded to what's right in front of us. Like the fact that I was doing so badly on my diet, I couldn't see that it was really my diet. I mean, even just noticing that I was having reactions to wheat took me ages to figure that out. And then I was realizing, oh, and I'm also having reactions to soy and legumes. And that's what finally got me back to meat is that I couldn't eat 
wheat or beans. And what do you eat if you're vegan? <laughs> you can't eat wheat or beans. You're, you're yeah, basically you can't, can't have, You can't have your seitan. <laughs> I was a tofu nut during my vegan years. I oh, was making right. tofu stuffed shells, tofu chocolate cream pies, fried tofu for breakfast, sweet potatoes for breakfast, sweet potato fries. Terrible. Yeah. The tofu, I only really ate it very intensely for a year, but that was right after that year was when my my health completely crashed. So I think that was really what did it for me was the tofu. It definitely, Uh, I think sure that's partly why I ended up needing a hysterectomy. Oh yeah, because soy is so good for your hormones. (laughs) Uh, All right, so if somebody thinks maybe they have uh, these problems, what What kind of foods should they eat and what should they avoid? Yeah, well, what you should eat really depends on your own situation, you know, what you're allergic to, what else is going on. That's like a whole personalized discussion. But human beings as a group are meant to be hunters in the ecological niche of things. And so animal products and animal fats really are central to getting enough fat soluble vitamins getting enough of absorbable and complete proteins and and getting enough minerals because the minerals in meats are easily absorbed and used by the body versus minerals in plants are bound up with fibers and other chemicals and they're very hard to extract and use as a nutritional component for your cells so that's called bioavailability and in the bioavailability of plant quote nutrients is very weak and it's another area where nutrition has been pretty too quiet you know they just haven't been making enough of an issue of it doing enough research on that just we've gone from being able to extract something in a laboratory process and saying that such and such an element is in that food like calcium is in spinach and saying that, okay, since we can find calcium in the lab in the spinach, we'll eat it for its calcium content. That's not how it works, especially when there's a food like spinach, which is really high in oxalate, most all that calcium, probably all of it, is actually calcium oxalate. And now that's a permanent bond. That is a toxic chemical. That's not a nutrient nutritional calcium. And now calcium is getting a lot of blame for the fact that it likes oxalate and becomes calcium oxalate in the body. And when we find calcium oxalate in the body, we just call it calcium and blame the calcium side of the partnership when it's really the oxalic acid that's stolen the calcium from your food and from your bones and from your blood and now turned it into an evil rogue that's going to cause trouble for your glands and your cells and your vascular system as it's running around inside your veins. It's really distressing those cells that line your vessel blood vessels and increasing the odds that you will get inflammation and damage in your vascular system and eventually end up with artery problems but it doesn't mean that the calcium did it and that's really confusing to people so on the don't eat side these high oxalate foods you know they're trouble and if you have gut inflammation they're even more trouble so If you've got any kind of digestive problem, you may be prone to absorbing more of this oxalate from the plant foods that have it and also being unable to extract the nutrients from those plant foods as well for multiple reasons. And um, that could get complicated too. But the simple thing is, is that the plant kingdoms making these poisons like oxalate for self-defense and for other metabolic needs that they have. It's strictly selfish on their part. They're not being very kindly to us. It somehow uh, they forgot to ask our permission for how they defend themselves. <laughs> so they're using some pretty good chemicals and oxalate is quite easy one to make. I mean, even the clouds can make oxalate. It's just a two carbon molecule and it uh, um, comes out of various oxidative reactions. So even acid rain, one of the acids in acid rain is oxalic acid. Oh, wow. So plants can make it, they make it from vitamin C and vitamin C in your own body can turn into oxalate. That's another source of oxalate is that your own body ends up um, discarding oxalate as a byproduct of metabolism when it's metabolizing vitamin C, hydroxyproline and glycine, which are amino acids that come from collagen and connective tissue and gelatin. 
and those can become oxalate in the body. So there's always a baseline amount of oxalate in your body that you make metabolically. And then when you eat a whole ton of it and you absorb a lot of it, then you're really overloading your body's capacity for handling it. And it ends up bioaccumulating in your tissues in your body. And where it goes is kind of idiosyncratic to each person and which systems in your body are most heavily interfered with and, and harmed from this excessive oxalate all the time is very individual. So there's a broad number of tissues in your body that can get in trouble with oxalate and each person, the picture is a little bit different. So the foods that are high in oxalate are all plant foods. There are seeds of plants as a group tend to be high in oxalate. So many spices are seeds like black pepper, um, cumin, those are high. Poppy seed, those kind of seeds are high. Then there's chia, hemp, tahini, which is sesame seeds, almonds, which what? is almonds. Almonds are the bioavailability of the toxic oxalate in almonds and peanuts is super high. So if you really want to make somebody sick on oxalate, give them a lot of almond bread, almond milk, uh, peanuts, peanut butter. They're very bioavailable. Um, and then other... My, my favorite foods was peanut butter. On When I did keto, I did keto for many years. It was ke um, almond milk and a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> it's so convenient. It's so convenient. And so uh, that's really concerning me because now, because of the peanut allergy concern, even pediatricians are telling mothers to start kids very young on a little bit of peanut butter all the time. And so peanut butter is being encouraged that mothers should be buying peanut butter and have it in their larder at home and, and raise their kids on it. And I think that's, peanuts weren't even human food until, I don't know, I guess it was when it was when Harvey Kellogg sort of invented peanut butter back okay. around 1900. Before that, peanuts were pig food. But he was a vegetarian, and he was developing vegetarian menus for his big kind of spa clinic that he had in Battle Creek, Michigan. Mm. He was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he was a disciple of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he set up a whole... Um, vegetarian nutrition plan that got really popular. He, he upsold this thing as a spa for the wealthy because he was very good at figuring out how to make this financially successful. So he targeted and it became the cool place for the presidents and really fancy people would go to this thing and learn that this basically vegan diet that he was feeding them was what was fixing them. So, Not the time off from their stressful lives or whatever yeah. else they were getting out of it. Maybe so we it was... had this tendency to think, oh, well, peanut butter is part of a healthy diet since it was invented because it's got this association with spa food. Well, I think that whole, I mean, if he was bringing the, I mean, they have, they had a whole other agenda, which was making people less frisky, right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> it's a it's... castration. Yeah. <laughs> Dietary castration by getting yeah. flesh out of the diet. So that is a, a whole other agenda. But then if they're telling the most wealthy and rich people, then it's going to have a trickle down effect through the whole society, you know? Yeah. The woman that he assigned to be his first dietitian out of his nursing school, they formed a nursing school. They got really into health and medicine. He was sent off to medical school by the Seventh-day Adventists, the people who founded the church of Seventh-day Adventism, which is built on this kind of austere vegetarian lifestyle, they financed his, his way into medical school. They were the ones who thought he should go to medical school because they set up this institution in Battle Creek and sort of handpicked him. He, was, he worked for them since he was like an early teenager and bonded with uh, the whites, the people who founded that that. Uh, sect that Protestant sect, the Seventh Day Adventist. So that's all a really fun story. I've been reading about the history of that because it turns out that the whole profession of dietetics, which is where my background is, is nutrition. It used to be called a dietitian. They've changed their names recently, but the the dietary profession in healthcare comes from that same root of the Seventh Day Adventist root. The person who founded the whole professional association which you still go through to get your licensing as a 
nutrition professional in mainstream nutrition is coming out of that same vegetarian tradition. And so, so it's one more blinder, one more reason to ignore all the other science that keeps popping up over the centuries about the problem with oxalate and plant foods. It doesn't fit that narrative that we've got to have plants and, and the borrowing of the idea that eating plants is better because now it's also better for your health. Like that idea got invented really from religious traditions and religious motivations, but it's been right there at the beginning of the professionalization of medicine and dietetics. Mm. So we've, we're just, we've been looking through these rose colored glasses, but we come from that tradition and we don't even know that that's where all our biases are really growing out of. And now they can just tell us that we're, Killing the earth if we eat that too. <laughs> if we don't eat that plants. Was, that, you know, that was my generation in the 70s. You know, Jimmy Carter put on a sweater, put on solar panels on the White House. We were all going to move towards a more, more recycling and more awareness and cleaning up the rivers. Like the Cleveland Cuyahoga River had been on fire. And, you know, we were in trouble with um, also gas shortages and pollution was becoming more of a concern. So in my era, environmentalism was important. You know, that was going to be where we're heading, that the futurists were all saying we're heading in that direction. And that was 50 years ago almost, or, you know, 40-something years ago. And we haven't really come very far with that. We haven't, as a culture, we're not as conscious now, I think, of the environment as we were back then. I know. I mean, my stepmom was... We had to eat beans and rice like once a week, every week. And she was into like Jane Brody cookbooks and John Robbins and all that stuff. And so, I mean, she wasn't a vegetarian, but she, 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 she always taught us that kind of, you know, this is the healthiest way. Like it was like subliminal, you know. It was very powerful. I was a Jane Brody follower. I had both of her cookbooks and learned to pig out on wheat berries you know you soak and cook wheat berries and eat them whole for breakfast and all this high starch stuff that jane brody was saying she said yeah be sure to cut the green stuff off your toxic potatoes but you can eat a lot of potatoes because they have vitamin c in them so therefore they must be good for you potatoes happen to be really high in oxalate and she and everyone else ignores that fact i think that fact was not well understood for a long time but um you know more recent testing since the 80s has shown it Potatoes are another major source of oxalate. So there was this huge high carb movement that Jane Brody, who's still around, uh, was a big voice in. And John Robbins was the reason I went vegan. And of course, your mom was following put the beans and the rice together because that gives you the complete protein. Complete protein. <laughs> that was Francis Moore LePay's message. And then other people in the, in the universities picked up on that as is that sort of pseudoscience and they started using it at the university level because more and more people were coming into the field i think of nutrition because of this more moral based thinking that not eating flesh must be good for somebody and for something and they wanted to prove it scientifically and be in a position of authority to influence our choices well i mean i wish that it was that way i mean right. you know we all wish that you didn't have to kill something to live but when I got sick, I was just like, well, it's them or me and I don't want to die. So, I mean, I couldn't get out of bed for a few months. So I was like, I'm going to do whatever I can. And I was told to eat more meat. So I was like, I'm going to do it. I don't care. Good for you. Good for you. That's a, that's a sign of mental health. If you can choose to live <laughs> some abstract idea, that's not even true. The sad part is when you eat a plate of, plate of pasta, you have in, killed by accident, maybe, a lot of crickets, bunnies, birds, moles, voles, and whatever should be living in that land where you monocrop this wheat that's become your pasta and your bagels and your, your supposedly non-murdering vegan foods aren't non-murdering at all. They're quite damaging to the ecosystem that supports the life of many, many kinds of animals, including the stuff that lives in soil. It is not a bloodless food, and that's it's just once removed so you just have the the high tower privilege of having a step removed from it so therefore it's not your fault that the farms kill all these animals because you're just innocently buying their bread yeah and pasta that that's just a delusion so um i want to switch gears to how much um how much 
I've had a lot of, I've had most people who have done carnivore, especially under my, <laughs> maybe they were, they followed me and then they tried it, you know, um, most of them did really well, but I've had a few people tell me, I mean, really just two <laughs> told me that they just could not get through the adaptation phase. It was just too, they felt just so horrible, even after about a month. Um, what do you think that is and what should people do if they're just, if it's just too intense? Well, I can totally relate to that. Uh, and the science demonstrates that what our clients are telling us is that their mitochondrial function is damaged. Their ability to process carbohydrates and other energy materials and to build muscle glycogen and do gluconeogenesis is broken. Oxalates damage the, the enzymes themselves, just a little bit of oxalate in the Petri dish with those enzymes and their function goes way down. Also, oxalate has direct damaging effects on mitochondria that can be very long lasting, maybe even quasi-permanent. So you can get a mitochondrial dysfunction disease where your ability to, to go zero car becomes almost permanently damaged. And there's no research on the prevalence of this because there's just not a wide understanding of how this is going on yet in science. But I can tell them that when I switched from vegan to meat, I realized how sugar addicted I was. And it took me three years of struggle to get over this the extreme feeling of being sugar addicted. And then when I was learning to fast and go going down to super low carb in, I don't know, a few years ago, it took me, you know, months of struggling and the willingness to, to go through days when I felt like garbage. Um, and eventually you can win over and live on a high fat diet, but I still, and many of my clients, we still have to add back some carbs every now and then to get the muscle glycogen up. Otherwise we get leg cramps and we get um, less restful sleep and we you just don't feel good. Um, so, you know, we don't have to make each sort of type of diet that has a nice name and a lot of cool people attached to it, like the carnivore diet. We don't have to make it a make or break thing or a hundred percent and you're not in, in, in the kind of a, a club. You, know, you can still be a carnivore and still give yourself some white rice or maple syrup or whatever it is you need to be able to function and to adapt the diet that's going to bring you back to a place where you can do healing work so and if, really bring if back they, your health. If they add a little bit of maybe some blueberries or something, then they would have less of those symptoms? Well, it depends on if they can handle the seeds and the, and the chemicals and the skin and all that, like the blueberries are an example of food I would love to have. I used to love them and pick organic ones every year and they're very versatile. You can do some cool things with them. But um, I've, the honest answer, once you really get off all the plant fibers and seeds and junkola and you really go on a animal food only diet and your gut starts to heal, your gut will let you know. Uh -uh. So you want to test things out one at a time for a few days here and there and give yourself a couple of weeks to see, am I tolerating the blueberries themselves or am I better off just experimenting with the idea of simple carbs so I can just test the carb piece. And the simpler carbs would be things like maple syrup or honey or even just sugar because there's nothing else there really that you're reacting to. Although honey, I'm allergic to honey and I think it's because it's loaded with pollen. Mm. And those of us with autoimmune conditions related to oxalate damage tend to have a lot of sensitivities, reactivities, and allergies in general. So if you come from an allergic family or you tend to have allergies, I, I wouldn't start with honey because you're experimenting with all kinds of random pollen that's in honey. Um, yeah. Maple syrup's a lot simpler, although it is a tree and tree's a plant, so there's some plant <laughs> essences in that too and if you're that sensitive you could just start with some organic sugar and you know sweeten something that you're eating in your diet but you need to get enough you know like at least 50 grams of sugar in a day preferably in an evening to be able to start to test to see if that's 
helping you with your symptoms of whether it's leg cramps or fatigue or bad sleep. What about whatever. headaches? Headaches. Yeah. yeah, and the headaches might be just the the toxicity of your body healing. You know, the the oxalate problem, if you've done, if you have a history of either lots of vegan foods, lots of nuts, lots of potatoes, spinach, Swiss chard, rhubarb, some of these really high oxalate foods, then you're probably got a, a burden of oxalates hanging around in your bones, your joints, your marrow, your glands. I mean, 85% of us, if we're over 50, have oxalate crystals, which are like kidney stones. It's the same stuff that makes a kidney stone is what the oxalate crystals are that are gathering in smaller bits throughout the body. So if you've got oxalates in a place that's interrupting the central nervous system function of your spinal cord and brain, you might get some brain inflammation or other kinds of um, blood flow issues that lend to headaches because it's either inflammation or blood flow problems that tend to bring on these headaches. And, and I never had them until, I don't know, about 15 years ago. And then I started being a chronic headache person too as part of this. And I think it was because that's when I upped my sweet potato game and my oxalates went up actually when I went from vegan and got rid of the beans, even though beans are high in oxalate, eating sweet potatoes every day was worse. Mm. Well, that's such a big thing on <clears throat> the paleo diet was sweet potatoes and almond stuff <laughs> was so big. Chocolate. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, I eat chocolate every day, too. Don't forget about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I tell people that's the last one you should bother giving up. And that's another high oxalate food that gets people into trouble. But I think until I went carnivore, I, I don't think I could have ever given up those foods because I was so addicted to sweeteners and, of course, stevia and um, and chocolate that until I went carnivore is when I lost my sweet, ta sweet tooth and um, I never could have got through keto. Well, I, I always think people should start with adding more animal fats as they're moving over and, and get enough fat and calories so that whatever cravings they're getting is not because you're under eating. Yes. Well, that is another big thing. Car people don't eat enough on carnivore. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It's so satisfying to sit down to a big plate of meat that you can stop before you should. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> at least, you know, you don't really have to stop as long as you just get full and um, so what is, is there a connection with thyroid, with Hashimoto's and oxalates or? Yeah, I believe there is. I believe there is because the thyroid gland is so prone to picking up oxalate. It's been known for a long time that oxalate accumulates in your thyroid gland. And it's very, very, very normal because it's oxalate so normal in the diet is really why. And tea is another popular food that gets people in trouble. You're in the part of the world that's sort of part of the sweet tea. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, even all the way over to like Kentucky, there's a whole sweet tea sweep there. Then, and that's why that area is considered part of the kidney stone belt, because not only do they do sweet tea, they do sweet potatoes and peanuts. That oh, yeah. whole area. So and, that, that, and collards and stuff like that. And, and greens. Yeah, green and, and, and you know, black eyed peas are pretty low in oxalate, but I think the black eyed peas are part of the, you know, tendency to do some form of beans in the diet, whether it's, you know, like, uh, and also okra. Okra is high in oxalate too. Oh, okay. Well, it's a perfect storm here. Um, I didn't grow up on, I drew, grew up on Diet Coke, so I was healthier than. <laughs> <laughs> we drink, we did drink a lot of tea though at night, but we would put like equal or, you know, Splenda in it or something. <laughs> My parents were health conscious, you know. Yeah, the late 70s, those artificial sweeteners really took off. Yeah. You know, the, everywhere. Like, yeah, I mean, I was a kid in the 90s that so was like fat-free everything and then yeah, artificial sweeteners and everything and fake butter and, and all that stuff. So, um, Why? It's amazing. So I know you, you, you have done a lot of public speaking and stuff and you have some critics, you know, that say maybe you're just because of your own personal experience that maybe you have like, you know, oxalate colored glasses. <laughs> what, what do you think about their, your critics? 
Well, you know, if you haven't tried it, what, what right do you have to even say anything about it? You, you, you have not read the literature, you have not looked up the references, you have not spent five years studying this, and you have not worked with people who are suffering from this disease. And how can you deny the fact that people are having dramatic reactions to a low oxalate diet? That there is this whole ignored population of people with chronic health problems that aren't getting help. They finally find out oxalates are things. People are having actual crystals popping out of their body parts. And when they go to their own doctor, their doctor says, oh, whatever. And they say, oh, that's just old calcium. They're very dismissive and love to deny that. That's a popular approach of anybody who's got the same old biases that is helping them make money, promote smoothies, blenders, almond bread, chocolate, or even the whole keto message like, oh, well, keto and carbs matter more than toxicity from a known poison that can literally kill somebody. That's not even rational denying. It's just like denying that pollution harms children's lungs. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I wonder if I had ever done keto, like just meat and maybe veggies and not so much all this extra stuff, maybe it would have been better, you know, but because I think there's so much keto products and keto everything that I fat feel like. Fat bombs, they're almost all yeah. little fat bomb things are nut-based and yeah. chocolate-based. Yeah. I mean, if maybe if I had just eaten a little bit of broccoli and and some yeah. hamburger meat and not not all gotten on into all the treats and the sweets and the, but I mean, you know, I think, but then you don't you know they don't make any money if you don't buy their bars and all that stuff you know, right? So it's hard to well, and we we don't want to give up our bread and our treats. We have built so much culture around muffins like. You are required to send your kid to school with muffins on birthdays. Well, if you're now a low carb family, you're going to send in the almond muffins and yeah. do a great thing for the classroom. And, you know, like we institute a one year old required to have a birthday cake in our society. If you don't do that for your kid, somehow your kid is, you know, Depri under deprived. Surprised. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's we, we have so many cultural biases that would have us not want to hear this. That's why those of us who are getting sick on oxalates are getting ignored and you can keep pretending it's not happening, but that's really, um, more self-serving than it is caring about the health of the public. And I, I never took my story as to mean that this is going on in a big way. It's only because everywhere I turn, I'm seeing this. I, you, when you start realizing what's going on, you just can't even bear the pain of watching people with crippled joints and so much pain and so many problems, severe problems, and no one's telling them that it's their almond habit doing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's like a, I don't know, it's like, why not try it? It can't hurt you to 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 reduce your oxalate foods, right? Hopefully it can't hurt you. We don't have any research, you know, about um, what does it mean that you're full of oxalates and you change your metabolism from one that's figured out how to continually defend you from the toxic effects of it as much as possible. And the body gets into this defense mode where it's basically shoving oxalate down into your bones and down into your tissues and pulling it out of the bloodstream. So because there's too much in the bloodstream, you change your electrolytes and you cause heart arrhythmias and heart problems. You overwhelm the kidneys and you harm the kidneys. So in order to protect the heart and the kidneys, the rest of the body is willing to sacrifice because without a heart and kidneys, the rest of the body is in that toast anyway. So there's a lot of this defense going on silently. It's a very silent process. The body tries not to complain that it's working hard on protecting you from heart damage and kidney damage with your oxalate diet. Um, and then when you suddenly stop, you've got to change all of your cellular and, and signaling and all this control that's been going on in the background is suddenly having to do a U-turn abruptly. And that is pretty stressful. And I think that the, the harder the change, like if you're really high in oxalate up here in the thousands of milligrams because you're doing 
keto breads and peanut butter on toast and snacking on peanut M&Ms and having French fries and sweet potatoes for dinner. And you're up there in high oxalate land. And then you suddenly realize you got to change something. If you change too fast, that's a very strong signal to the body. Oh, there's way less oxalate coming in. Now we can finally clean it out, you know, because the body's been wanting to get rid of it all along and waiting for a break. It's just that the way we eat all the time and eat the same foods over and over again, there's never been that break. And you provide a sudden break and it might cause uh, a kind of a metabolic stress that could cause overzealous releasing of oxalate from the tissue and could dump so much oxalate out into the kidneys and bloodstream and so on that it could be very stressful on your metabolism and could be kind of dangerous even. So, cause we see people end up in the emergency room with heart arrhythmias and T wave inversions and just scary things, or even kidney stones happen after you stop eating the oxalate, especially in postmenopausal women. I think this is more likely because there's so much oxalate now coming out from all your past consumption that it's overwhelming the kidneys even though you when you stop eating it you can actually basically raise the effective level of oxalate coming back out into the bloodstream and back out through the kidneys and so on so you you do want to be aware of what you're doing if you're if you've been on a super high oxalate diet and give yourself some time to work back down kind of gently land the whole system down in a gentle kind of way not be too drastic so I mean, on that same uh, continuum, what are some advice, some practical advice you give people who are uh, thinking maybe this is a problem for them? Yes. Well, um, please read as much as you can ahead of time. And, and like my website is loaded with free information um, and lots of these kinds of discussions about the oxalate. So there's a, more resources than there used to be. I've been trying to put out enough of the conversation so that people who are motivated to do so can learn some things ahead of time. And then, you know, take your time with it. Cut down your portions of your really high oxalate food at first for a few days. You know, have one bite of your keto muffin and a half a spinach smoothie or something for a couple of days. <laughs> and then really get off of those one at a time and work your way down. And so you have plenty of time to do the learning about what it means to be completely low oxalate. Just recognize that peanuts, sweet potatoes, nuts in general, especially almonds, spinach, Swiss chard, beets and beet greens, these kind of things need to go. Your turmeric supplements, if they're whole root turmeric, that needs to go too. Um, so we've been promoting things that are really high. Blackberries are really high. Kiwis are really high. Uh, clementines are really high. There's, there's all kinds of foods like that that could be contributing to <laughs> You've described my husband's like entire diet. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh, I mean, well, if, if you ever really want to get rid of somebody, feed them like that and then feed them lots of tea. And you know, you could literally make somebody sick on purpose if you really <laughs> wanted to become evil. When you love somebody, it's kind of concerning that they're, that we've all, we've all gravitated to these foods that are so high in oxalate. Yeah. And I mean, I've told him so many times, like, stop eating. I mean, I've got him off grains and stuff like that. And that's so hard just to, to get him there. And then, you know, you, you start making like keto pizzas and, you know, stuff like that. So it's really challenging. And then, you, you know, you got to eat crow and say, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You know, I've been in the business of nutrition for a long time. You know, it was in 1977 when I decided I would be a health promotion nutrition nut. And I've never come out wanting to tell people what to eat until I figured this thing out. I've been all around the block. I have studied it all. I've been tried it all, done it all. I've never felt any reason to tell people what to eat. I've worked in, in integrative medicine and public health and grant writing because it's much easier to like work on policy and research and not have to really decide what's the right diet. But this business, I was like, nobody's warning anybody. And it's a huge failing in my field of public health. I'm in the field of public health nutrition. Public health nutrition has allowed us to go crazy on spinach, go crazy on almonds, go crazy on blackberries and all these, you know, five a day kind of produce. 
without any warning to people <laughs> with chronic urinary problems, chronic kidney stones, chronic thyroid problems, chronic uh, autoimmune conditions. All these people should be just as a standard professional courtesy to the public, be warned that spinach and these other high oxalate foods are dangerous for people with health problems. They're dangerous for the elderly. They're dangerous for infants. They're probably not good for pregnant women. They're not good in a hospital. They're not good in nursing homes. This should be standard discussion in my field of public health nutrition, and it's not. So I'm willing to stand up and take some slings and arrows from anybody who wants to keep the status quo going because I love everybody who doesn't want to feel like garbage. You know, you're my friend if you're willing, because we're really an elite subset of the public. I think 80% of the public is sleep to nutrition. They're so sick of this discussion. Oh, it used to be oat bran. It used to be this, it used to be that. Well, whatever. They're just going to McDonald's and ignoring us. Yeah. You know, that's the group that a lot of the keto docs are trying to reach and tell them, look, you can't keep pigging out on commercial carbohydrates. You're killing yourself. Let's do something else. But their solution, same with like the paleo answers and the fat bombs, people are just inventing this stuff and making money on their cookbooks and becoming public figures. But it's not based on well-reasoned nutrition. Our field of nutrition is in horrible shape. It's, it's <laughs> so any old anybody can make stuff up. And that's not me. I have been digging this out of the literature and making sense out of it from the science side. And I'm sharing my story to illustrate that I don't want you to become like me. <laughs> you know, I'm a terrible warning. I'm not a great example. I'm a terrible warning. Do not do what I did and live on sweet potatoes. Absolutely. So where can people um, find you and do you have a book coming out or? I have a cookbook that's now available on my website as a PDF. It's 181 recipes and that's a uh, gluten-free. The eggs are all segregated in one chapter because a lot of us have egg issues. I think that could be related to immunizations where you could end up with an egg allergy. It's, um, you know, mostly low carb. It's got a few carby things in there because some of us really need a little carbs. You know, it's a little bit for everybody. Um, so that's available and I am working on a book and, um, that is probably still a little over a year away from now, maybe a year and a half away from now. So be looking for that book in a while, but in the meantime, um, you can do plenty to help your health before my book comes out. And when it does come out, we can all work together to help raise awareness with people like your husband and others who could be heading for trouble if they're not alerted to the possibility that plants are trying to get you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i wonder so um this is a really important message sally and i think you know we have to stay open all the time in nutrition or else we're just going to get uh we're just gonna stop learning and and be closed off and maybe be hurting ourselves so it's so important i'm so grateful that you came on today and it's um really important so Everyone, please uh, visit Sally's website. It's sallyknorton.com. That's right. Okay. And uh, if this is something that resonates with you or you're worried about, and um, please subscribe and like this channel and uh, leave a comment down below if, about what you thought about this video. So we really appreciate it. See you next time.